A few minutes ago, I used a term, economic democracy, that needs some explaining. Economic democracy is about extending the values and rights of democracy into the economic sphere. It is about democratizing power and creating environmentally sustainable economies. In its full-orbed version, it features mixed forms of worker, community, and mutual fund, or public bank, enterprises. If, in the midst of this terrible economic crisis, we created a public bank that supported cooperatives and startups and green technology, that would be a major breakthrough for economic democracy in this country. I do not believe that the factors of production trump everything else. But I do believe that those who control the terms, amounts, and direction of credit have a huge role in determining the kind of society that everybody else lives in. We are getting a dramatic demonstration of that today. Gains toward social and economic democracy are needed today for the same reason that political democracy is necessary, to restrain the abuse of unequal power. Economic democracy, like political democracy, is messy and time-consuming. Democratically controlled capital is less mobile than corporate capital, and the return to democratically controlled capital tends to be lower than in corporations because worker-controlled enterprises are more committed to keeping low-return firms in operation. Producer cooperatives are often too small and slow and humane to compete with corporations, and they require cooperative habits and values that cut against the grain of American individualism. In the U.S., any strategy to break down concentrated economic power by expanding the cooperative sector confronts difficult trade-offs and political opposition and cultural barriers. But economic democracy also has pragmatic considerations in its favor. Economic losses caused by worker participation can be offset by gains in productivity made possible by it. People often work harder and more efficiently when they have a stake in the company. The Mondragon network in Spain is spectacularly successful. In the U.S., several thousand firms have converted to employee ownership. Thousands of others have been launched with worker ownership plans, and approximately a thousand companies in the U.S. are fully worker controlled. These developments are not yet, but have the potential to become the building blocks of a serious movement for economic democracy. On the way to a serious movement, economic democracy is about building up institutions that do not belong wholly to the capitalist market or the state. It begins by expanding the cooperative sector. These strategies widen the base of social and economic power by mixing together cooperative banks, employee stock ownership plans, producer cooperatives, and planning agencies that guide investments into locally defined areas of need, such as housing, soft energy hardware, infrastructure maintenance, and mass transit. But merely expanding the cooperative sector is not enough. Cooperatives usually prohibit non-working shareholders, so they attract less outside financing than capitalist firms. They're committed to keeping low-return firms in operation, so they tend to stay in business even when they can't afford to pay competitive wages. They're committed to particular communities, so they're less mobile than corporate capital and labor. They smack of anti-capitalist bias, so they have trouble getting financing and advice from banks. They tend to maximize net income per worker rather than profits, so they tend to favor capital-intensive investments over job creation. And because cooperative owners often have their savings invested in a single enterprise, they tend to avoid risky innovations. These problems can be mitigated with productivity-enhancing tax incentives and regulations. The kind of economic development that favors the needs of poor and disenfranchised communities and does not harm the Earth's atmosphere requires a dramatically expanded cooperative sector consisting of worker-owned firms rooted in communities, committed to sustainability, and prepared to accept lower returns. But we also need something bolder and more visionary than expanding the cooperative sector. 
We need forms of social ownership that facilitate democratic capital formation, have a greater capacity for scaling up, and are more entrepreneurial. Specifically, we need public banks and mutual funded holding companies. This approach can take a variety of forms, but the essential idea is to establish competing banks or holding companies in which ownership of productive capital is vested. The companies lend capital to enterprises at market rates of interest and otherwise control the process of investment, including decision-making power to initiate new cooperatives and shut down unprofitable firms. Equity shareholders, the state, and or other cooperatives own the holding companies or the public banks. Mutual fund models of this kind contain a built-in system of wage restraints, and they facilitate new forms of capital formation. This approach does not rest on idealistic notions about human nature, and it should not be the next progressive blueprint. Economic democracy is a break on human greed and domination. The whole point of it is to fight the universal propensity of dominant groups to hoard social goods and abuse disenfranchised people. Neither should progressives absolutize any particular model of economic democracy, for the blueprint mentality is inherently problematic. I have theories and favorite models to push, but the key thing is to expand the social market in different ways and find out which models work best in particular circumstances. Most of our traditions in social theory and Christian social ethics operated with unitary ideas of capitalism and socialism as, they, as though each were only one thing. Economic democracy must be a project built from the ground up, piece by piece, opening new choices, creating more democracy, building an economic order that allows for places of rest, social contracts, common goods, and ecological flourishing. It nurtures and sustains social trust, a form of social capital that no healthy society can do without. It is a project that breaks from the universalizing logic of state socialism, taking seriously that there are different kinds of capitalism. The tests of any experiment in it are pragmatic. To impose something like the Mondragon Network on a capitalist society would require coercion over workers who don't want to belong to cooperatives. The U.S. Pacific Northwest today has a network of long-standing, highly successful plywood cooperatives. Some plywood workers choose to work in conventional firms instead of the cooperatives. No political economy worth building would force them into a different choice. But the issue of choice is the key to a better alternative. A politics that expanded the cooperative and social ownership sectors would give workers important new choices. The central conceit of neoclassical economics could be turned into a reality if meaningful choices were created. The neoclassical conceit is that capitalism doesn't exploit anyone because labor employs capital as much as capital employs labor. But in the real world, the owners of capital nearly always organize the factors of production. To expand the cooperative and other social market sectors would give choices to workers that neoclassical theory promises but does not deliver. It would show that there is an alternative to a system that stokes and celebrates greed and consumption to the point of self-destruction. The Earth's ecosystem cannot withstand a U.S. American lifestyle for more than one-sixth of the world's population. The economy is physical. There are limits to economic growth. For 30 years, you had to be a stubborn type to sail against the religion of the market. Now you need only to be awake. If the stubborn types can seize this terrible moment as an opportunity to build a better social order, we may actually do it. <laughs>